بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. This is our second class in what is Sufism. Let's just review very very briefly what we talked about last night in the first class. We showed on the basis of Hadith Jibreel, which is called Ummul Hadith and Umm al Sunnah, it's one of the most authentic and solid pieces of Hadith of all, that Sufism, which is the science of Ihsan, is a fundamental part of the Islamic religion because Ihsan is one of the basic elements of the deen, as this hadith makes very clear. And so, as Islam, Iman, and Ihsan, all of them produced their various sciences and disciplines throughout history, so also Ihsan produced this phenomenon that was called Sufism. And this is very important, and we'll come back to this. We noted that um, the word Sufism is a neologism, a neologism. That means it's a new word, it's a made-up word. And if you want to say an innovation, it's true, it is an innovation. However, it is a permissible innovation, if not better than that. We made names for everything, and Aqidah is one of the names that we made up, for example. Uh, one of the remarkable things about the word Sufism, which appears towards the end of the first century and in the beginning of the second century of Hijra, is that it was a word that no one ever knew exactly what it means. Is it from Suf, the wearing of wool? That to me appears the most probable. And we gave examples of that, and then also, as one of the wonderful participants pointed out, there are reports about people like Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, God be pleased with him, wearing wool, coarse wool, next to their skin under beautiful garments, which they would do as an act of asceticism. And so that's also a very, very good point to note that we forgot to note before. But it could be from Safa, purity. It could be from a Sufa, which is the bench where the poor Sahaba would stay, like Abu Huraira. It could be from a Saf al Awal. It could be even from Sophia, the Greek word for wisdom, but that's not likely. But it's an appropriate word because of the fact that one of the principles of Ihsan is to be hidden. And one of the fundamental characteristics of the awliya of Allah is that they love to be hidden. And they don't like claims. And they don't like pretense. And they never regard themselves to be exceptional people. So therefore the word Sufi fit them, although they didn't claim to be Sufis either. And you don't, usually you don't find among them people who say, I am a Sufi. If they did, that would be a claim, especially because it came to mean what it came to mean. In other words, a person who embodies Ihsan. We also noted here that uh, the Sufis were, and they must remain, if they're authentic, the biggest critics of themselves. And if we look in the Sufi tradition, you see again and again, that they critique themselves and they are hard on themselves and they have to be. This is very, very important. And part of that critique of themselves is the statement that they would make as early as um, the fourth century of the Hijra, perhaps easy, earlier than that, that Sufism was a reality without a name that then became a name without a reality. So that's a self-critique. And here in this, we talked about it in detail, you see that that reality without a name, what do they mean by that? They mean the Ihsan, as embodied in the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and in his companions 
and in the great successors and these people that we call the Salaf al-Salih, who are the light, lights of the Ummah. So they embody this reality better than anyone before them or after them. But once the name appears, then there will be people who claim that name for themselves who don't embody the reality. And that actually becomes very prominent, very prevalent. And the warning against the false Sufi goes back to the earliest Sufi literature. Beware of the makers of claims. Beware of the false Sufis. Um, so we talked about hiddenness, the imperative of hiddenness. Uh, we mentioned the principle min kamal al-anbiya'i al-zuhur wa min kamal al-awliya al-khafa that one of the elements of the perfection of prophecy and messengerhood is to appear and to be known. So the prophets are always known and they have to say, I'm a prophet, I'm a messenger. But part of the perfection of wilaya is to be hidden. And therefore, the people of Ihsan and the great awliya, they don't like to be known as that. And they don't even know themselves in many cases as that. So that's very, very important. And we mentioned that um, the awliya of Allah do not want uh, they want to know God, and they don't want to be known by people as knowing God. And this is a treasure that they keep in their hearts. And it's one of the reasons why that treasure grows and grows and grows and becomes so amazing. And we noted last time also that um, the things the Sufis do are the opposite of what Satan would do. So Satan is the great lover of appearance. He is the great maker of claims. He is the, cla he is the claimant that believed that he was perfect, although he was the most imperfect of all. And so the Sufis never will do that. And he always said, and they say one of his greatest sin was when he said, Anna, I. So even you find among the Sufis, people who don't like to say Anna, they will say al-faqir, or they will say al-haqir, the, the wretched one, meaning me. And of course some of them don't do that, but again, they always like, try to look at what Satan would do, and they will do the opposite. And then also, um, we will see when we talk about wilaya and about sainthood, that in Islam, every believer is a saint. Allahu waliyu ladhina amanu. God is the wali of those who believe. So they're awliya. This is one of the amazing things about Islam, by the way, because that wasn't the case with earlier dispensations, earlier religions like Christianity or Judaism. But for us it is. And therefore also, anything that is a principle of iman, um, you will see that it's also you know, a principle of tasawwuf as well. Uh, so, for example, we mentioned last time that um, the Prophet ﷺ is the first essential link in Sufism, and all the chains go back to him. And the love of him is one of the basic elements, and salat on him as well. But this is also a principle of iman, isn't it? Because لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من نفسه إلى آخره. Because the Prophet ﷺ would say that none of you believes until I am more beloved to him than himself, and so forth. His mother, his father, and everything else. So this is also another principle that anything that is <laughs> essential to iman, it will be an essential principle of the path. Um, we mentioned that in being hidden and in keeping secrets and doing the kind of things that they do, um, the Sufis are intent 
in removing any veil that could be between them and God. And Satan always is veiled from his Lord. And one of the ways that he is veiled is by his huge ego and his claims. So in not doing these things, they're seeking not to be veiled. But also you will see that this explains other things as well, such as the fact that although we don't ask to be tried by God, and we don't want tribulation, but when tribulation comes, al-bala, the Sufis actually welcome it. And they will say things like Ibn Atta Allah said, al-faqatu a'yadul muridin, the troubles are the festivals of the murids. What does that mean? Affliction is your festival? But why? Because afflictions always give you irtiqa. When God afflicts you with anything, sickness, loss of loved ones, um, whatever you can think of, then you have to turn to Him. And you cannot turn to creation, especially in the big afflictions. So the nature of affliction is that it removes creation from the picture. You've got nothing to turn to but God. So therefore, it lifts you up, it raises your state. Also part of their hiddenness and the avoiding of false claims is the fact that they like to hide themselves. And often they hide themselves in things like ignorance. And be concealed in ignorance. And again, they don't do that hypocritically. Uh, we have the great Ibn Atta Allah, God be pleased with him, who says in his Munajat, Ilahi, Ana jahilun fi ilmi, fa kayfa la akunu jahulan fi jahli. Oh my God, my God, my beloved God, I am ignorant in my knowledge. Is he saying that with any kind of tongue in cheek? No because it's true of every one of us, even of him who is a thousand times greater than a person like me could ever dream of being. He is a master of everything. But he says, I am ignorant in my knowledge. So how could I not be infinitely ignorant, extremely ignorant in my ignorance? But again, this is hiding. It is also truthful. It is also truthful, but this is one of the most fundamental purpose, uh, pr principles about them and also one of the most important principles of the path. We did mention that although they hide, and part of the hiding too, is that they don't like their karamat to be seen. And therefore, if you see a man or woman who is seeking karamat, and maybe doing lots of adhkar, so that they can have karamat, those people are astray. That's not the path at all. In fact, the Sufis are ashamed of their karamat. And um, they th say things about them that are really almost rude to express how ashamed they are of their karamat. Uh, one great sheikh said, I took my karamat and buried them in the seventh earth. So this is also part of the hiding and not wanting to be known. As uh, Abu Medyan said and we mentioned last night, Abu Medyan would say, Al-ghayra and ta'rifu wa la tu'raf. Ghayra, which is the defense of honor. We need to get a better translation for it. It's not just honor, which is irb, it's defense of that. But <clears throat> he said, ghayra is that you know God, but are not known by people as knowing God. You don't want to be known. Yet, at the same time, sometimes their karamat will be shown, and sometimes they will even show karamat. And they will do that to break hard hearts, you know, to get things under control. 
um, Sahal ibn Abdullah at Tustari, who's one of the greatest of them all, uh, he hated to show karamat. But one of his students, he said, show me a karama, show me a karama. And apparently the student must have been in need of that because he did. He took him down the street in Basra and he went to a blacksmith and there was a piece of red hot iron in the fire. And he reached in and pulled it out and wasn't even burned. Okay, so yakfi, is that enough for you? Okay, and like, they don't like to do that. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani has many karamat. In fact, we don't like to talk about them either. But he did them to discipline the kings, to discipline the princes, to bring them under the control of the Sharia, and also to create the jihad movement of Salah ad-Din Ayyubi. So this needed some karamat. But as a rule, even he wouldn't like to show them. But as we said, that's an exception to the rule. We mentioned also that although the word Sufi is actually an amazing word, and we must restore it to rectitude. Uh, it has the greatest stigma of any word in our lexicon today. And this is because of what false Sufis have done, by the way. I mean, so we bear the blame. But <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, even when talking about Sufism, they would prefer usually to use the word, use the word tasawwuf. Tasawwuf. Why? Because tasawwuf is attempting to be like a Sufi. It's imitating a Sufi. So he might say, ana mutasawwuf, meaning like, I like to imitate them, I like to dress like them. But that doesn't make a claim to actually being one. So the words are not the same. So we talked about these things and of course what we stressed most important of all at the end was Sharia and Haqiqah. There is no Sufism whatsoever without Sharia. There is no Sufism whatsoever in violation of Sharia. And there is no Haqiqah. There is no real Haqiqah without Sharia either. But the Sharia needs to have Haqiqah for it to be alive and to be beautiful. And we showed how Imam Malik, Abu Hanifa, Al Shafi'i, Ahmed ibn Hanbal, all of them have sheikhs. Who is the sheikh of Abu Hanifa? Jafar al-Sadiq. Who, who are the sheikhs of Imam Malik? Muhammad al-Baqir and Jafar al-Sadiq. Who are the sheikhs of Imam al Shafi'i? Shaiban al-Ra'i and al Sayyid al-Nafisa. A Sayyid al Nafisa, this incredible woman. And who is the Shaykh of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, Shaybhan al Ra'i, and also Ma'ruf al Karhi. And we mentioned uh, Abu Su Sufyan al Thawri. And we mentioned how Sufyan al Thawri um, was, his Shaykh was uh, Abu, Abu Hisham, and so forth. And so, you know, the law is absolutely important. And Irshad is one of the fundamentals of Sufism, guidance, but guidance requires borders, it requires limits, it requires tawabit, things to be set that don't move, goalposts that don't shift, and of course we get those from the Sharia, very, very important. Um, so that's a, a, a brief review of what we talked about yesterday. And now we will start tonight's lesson. So we spoke about the primacy of the law. And let's just continue that theme by looking at the primacy of the Quran and the Sunnah, which is the same thing. Uh, maybe it's a little bit broader, but actually it's not. But let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, the Sufis lived in awe of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. And they are also masters of the Qur'an. And many of them, they're not just hafiz, it's like they, they know the Qur'an so well, it's almost as if they can contemplate it in its entirety all at once. They live in the Qur'an, and they live in the Sunnah of the Prophet, and they live in the Hadith of the Prophet. And they are filled with the lights that come from that. 
Abu Yazid al-Bistami, who is one of the great masters of the time of Imam al-Junaid, he used to say, how amazing it is that a person can utter the words of the Adhan, the call to prayer, and not die from uttering them. Meaning that you and me, we hear the adhan, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And so you say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Right? That's what you're supposed to do. How can you not die from that? You know, from the, from the, you know, the power of those words. And this is really the kind of people they were. That they, they lived in the presence of these great realities. So, Quran and Sunnah. Let's take some quotations. I'm going to put them in chronological order. <laughs> and we'll begin with Abu Sulaiman al darani And these are great people. Great people. You mentioned their names, Baraka comes down. And he is of the third century. I'll not give dates because I'm pedantic enough as it is. But um, Abu Sulaiman al darani he says, one of the sayings, nukta, nukta we use often as joke, but here he means one of the aphorisms, one of the sayings. He says, one of the sayings of the people, meaning the Sufis, may fall into my heart for days. In other words, it fascinates me for days. I think about it for days. But I do not accept it without two witnesses. What are they? Al-Kitab wa Sunnah. I've got to find a witness for this in the book and in the sunnah. And that doesn't mean that he's got to find exactly that word, but it means he's got to find in the kitab and sunnah the muntalaq, you know, the, the matla. He's got to find the place where this reality is manifested in the revelation that God gave to our blessed messenger. And, you know, this, this is the way they are. And if you take the great masters like the Shaykh al-Akbar, he is a master of Qur'an. He is a master of hadith. No doubt one of the greatest muhaddiths who ever was. And he never says anything without prefacing that with the Qur'an and hadith. And then he draws from them meanings that are absolutely amazing. But they're based on that. Sari as saqati who died about 40 years after Darani, again in the 3rd century, which is the 9th century of our common period. period. I'm a pedant, you have to forgive me. I've got to just not talk about dates, okay? But um, he said, a little bit of sunnah is better than a whole lot of bid'ah. So we don't want bid'ah. And of course, when he says bid'ah here, he means bid'ah muharrama, bid'ah makruha. And the word bid'ah, mafhum al bid'ah, is one of the most important concepts. There's a great book by the Egyptian Sheikh al Arfaj called Mafhum al Bid'ah. It's very, very good. Uh, you do well to get it and to read it. But um, the bid'ah, as our scholars tell us, if we use the word bid'ah for everything new, and not just for bad things that are new, then bid'ah is five types. Obligatory, recommended, permissible, reprehensible, and forbidden. But he's talking here about bad bid'ah. So we don't want any of that, and they didn't want that. Um, Abu Yazid al-Bistami, he is again in the 3rd century, uh, 9th century, around the time of Imam Junaid. Um, he <coughs> went one time with a friend to meet a pious man who was staying in a mosque and who was known to be extremely ascetic, extremely zahid. So they said, let's go see him. And uh, so they went to that mosque, and they entered the mosque at night, and uh, uh, I don't know at night, but they entered the mosque at a time when there were no one there but that man or very few people. But he didn't know they'd come in. And so he spat 
in the direction of the Qibla. Uh, now, that would be very bad in any mosque, but uh, one of the things you might call to mind is that probably in that mosque, uh, there might have been a dirt floor. And so they would spit and they would cover it over. But he spat in the direction of the Qibla. It, it's not a nice thing to do, whether there was a floor or not. But um, Abu Yazid said, this man is not to be trusted. Regarding one of the courtesies, adab, of the sunnah. How then could he be trusted regarding the claim he makes about having arrived at the maqamat of the awliya, at the stations of the awliya? Let's go back. So they didn't even give him salams. They didn't even introduce themselves. They just quietly left and went back home. Again, this great Sahil ibn Abdullah at Tustari, this is one of the greatest of them all. Allah be pleased with him. At the end of the third century, ninth century, he said, our fundamental principles on the path are seven. Hold to the book of God, exalted be he, Al-Kitab. Hold to the book of God. Follow the sunnah of the messenger of God, number two. Okay, there you've got it. Then, number three, eat only what is halal. Number four, refrain from every type of abuse. Abuse being here, adha. He says, kaf al is what he's talking about. Don't offend people. Um, put aside all iniquitous behavior, all unrighteous behavior, atham. Turn back to God in repentance, do toba. That's number six. And number seven, fulfill all rights. The rights of God, the rights of the Prophet, the rights of all created things. So they're serious about these things. And again, that's their secret. Everything they get, it comes out of this position. Imam al-Junaid, we've talked about before, yesterday, and some of the things he said about the Sunnah. But he's called the proof of the Sufis. And he was a beautiful man. Beautiful man. And um, one of his contemporaries, another great Sufi, who's called al-Haddad, he said that if intellect had a human form, it would look like El Junaid. So he's like the manifestation of intelligence. If you were to see him, he radiated aql. And the Sufi path requires aql, by the way. You know, um, they say that God doesn't take a stupid man as a wali. Um, if he does, he will make him not stupid. He will give him aql, you know, but you can't follow the path without aql. You have to have it. But Imam al-Junaid, he said, all the paths are blocked before creation, meaning all the paths to God are blocked before creation, between, before people, except for the person who imitates the Prophet وسلم, and follows his footsteps closely and holds to his sunnah and keeps his tariqah, his path. All paths of good are open to you if you do these things. And then as he said, and I believe I mentioned this yesterday, he said, uh, this madhab of ours, madhab here meaning this way of proceeding, this way of going, this way of living, is muqayyadun bil kitabi wa sunnah. It is bound by the Qur'an and the sunnah. In another transmission it says mushayyadun. It is erected high on the Qur'an and the sunnah. Um, Abu al-Husayn al-Warraq al-Naysapuri, 4th century Sufi, very great. He said, the servant of God cannot arrive to God, but by God, and by doing that which pleases him, and that conforms to his Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his, sh his shara'ya, 
and the legal rulings that he has set down. You can't arrive to God without that. You've got to have that. Whoever makes the path of arrival, whoever claims that the path of arrival to God is something other than following the messenger, will go astray in the very place where he believes he has been rightly guided, istidraj. If we think that we can arrive at God without God, and without pleasing Him, and without following His prophet, then we will go astray. And not just that you'll go astray, but you'll go astray right where you are sure you are right. This is what he knows, and this is what he says. So that's not just a statement about the primacy of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, but it's a warning. That if you leave them, you will be the victim of istidraj. You will be guided astray little by little, and you will be wrong just where you think you're right. Ibrahim ibn Dawood al-Qassar, another early 4th century figure, 10th century of the common era, to love God is to obey God and His Messenger. He said, the sign of the love of God, exalted be He, is to prefer His obedience over everything else, in addition to following His Messenger. So this is a refrain. And if you look in their book, you'll see, their books, you'll see this refrain is always coming back again and again. Uh, Abu al-Qasim al-Nasarabadi, he said, this is again 4th century, not 10th century, he says, the foundation of all Sufism is to hold firmly to the Book of God and the Sunnah of the Prophet It is to abandon delusory passions and innovations Get rid of the innovations, they won't help you. It is to reverence all that pertains to the sanctity, the hurma of the true shaykhs. Ta'zim hurmat al-mashayikh. It is to acknowledge and accept the excuses that people give for themselves. Ru'yatu a'adhar al-khalq. Like, don't be rough on people. When people excuse themselves to you, even if they're not telling the truth or the whole story, accept it. Be kind. Uh, foundations of the path. Among them also is to keep beautiful company with your companions on the path. To live with them in the most beautiful way. In the most gracious way. Keep beautiful company with your companions on the path, and serve them. It is to put beautiful acts of character into practice. استعمال الأخلاق الجميلة It is to put beautiful acts of character into practice. It is to hold faithfully to the awrad. So you have awrad and azkar and ahzab. So hold to them faithfully. It is to avoid the performance of licenses, ruchas, and far-fetched interpretations, interpretations ta'wilat. So it, here in the law, as a rule, the Sufis will be the people of azima. They don't take licenses <laughs> as a rule. They will give them to you, but usually they won't follow them themselves. They'll do it the hard way. They'll do it the hard way. Uh, and they say, he says, no one ever goes astray on this path except because of having had a dishonorable, or maybe we can say dishonest beginning. For a bad beginning will come back to affect them at the end. So that's a warning. And what does that mean to me? What does it mean to you wonderful people? What it means is jaddidu and niya every day. Renew your intention every day and get it right. Why do you love this path? Because you love God. 
Why do you follow it? Because you want God. There's no other reason. Not because you want to be known as a Sufi, not because you want to be a Shaykh or a Shaykha, not because you want to be recognized as such. No, you want to know God. Imam al-Ghazali, may Allah be pleased with him, this great man, incredible man. Um, he says, all of their movements and all of their stillnesses, speaking about the Sufis, all of their harakat and sakanat, all of their movements, all of their stillnesses, in their outward and their inward, are borrowed from the light of Mishkat and Nabuwa, of the niche of prophecy, the niche of prophecy. Um, there is not, after that, light, uh, anything else. Okay, this is all there is that you can take as a guidance. Uh, here we want to make a point, this is an important point, that uh, one of the things that some Orientalists have contended, I wonder if we could do without the music, yeah. Um, one of the things that some of the Orientalists have contended is that Imam al-Ghazali is the one who makes Sufism orthodox absolutely false. It was orthodox from the beginning. Uh, he is one of the ones who defends its orthodoxy and he shows that it must be in agreement with the law but as you can see from the quotations this was the refrain from the very beginning and um, the antinomian Sufi as they're called, the lawless Sufi who believes he can drink wine or he can, you know, mix with women or he can do whatever he wants. These were never Sufis to begin with. But they do become a fitna in many times, including our own time. Okay, so they're the ones who will give Sufism a bad name. And they are very harmful. But Imam al-Ghazali um, is not changing something that was there in Sufism, he's simply, simply establishing the fundamental principles that were there from the beginning. He made no claim whatsoever of making Sufism uh, orthodox. These are misreadings of history and let's give the people the credit of the doubt that they do this as honest mistakes, but one of the worst things that happens to us Muslims is when we take our deen from people who are not qualified to give it. And if you look at the literature and the writings of the Orientalists and others, uh, there is a great deal of good that can be gleaned from their works. They're not demons, at least they're not all that way. They're not even most of them that way. Some of them are, but and some of them served colonial interests and that's all they cared about. But um, usually they don't really know, and they're self-taught. So when we study them, you have to be strong, and you have to study them carefully. And you need guidance in doing that, but you have to take your deen from its own sources. And a lot of the hatred of Sufism and stigma against it in the Muslim Ummah today comes from whom? The Orientalists. They will be the ones that will say things about the Sufis, you know, that are not true. That they're responsible for the decadence of Muslims, the backwardness of Muslims. No, they are the builders of civilization. They are the makers of culture. You know, that they didn't do jihad, they were pacifists. What? They were the biggest mujahids ever. And there was no army that didn't have Sufis in it. And the word murabit, which is a word that we use for mujahid, came to be synonymous with Sufi in North Africa. So uh, these are all falsehoods, fundamental, and we need to get things right. Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, may Allah be pleased with him, he dies in the year um, 561, which is 1165. Uh, this man was great. Sultan al-Awliya, the Shaykh of Salah al-Din, the Shaykh of Nur al-Din, the commander of Salah al-Din. Um, but he says, 
and he is Sheikh al Islam and a reviver of the Hanbali school. And he is a, a, a mufti of the Shafi'i school and the Hanbali school. Shaykh al Islam in the Quran, in the Sunnah, in all outward knowledge, but also Sultan al Awliya. But he said, every haqiqah that does not have the Sharia as its witness is zandaqa. He won't give it the time of day. Any haqiqah, any claim to any truth of ultimate reality that does not have the Sharia as its witness is zandaqa. Fly to al haqq Fly to God, the real. Azza wa Jal, exalted and glorious be He on the two wings of the Kitab and the Sunnah. Beautiful. And this is His whole life. Enter upon Him with your hand in the hand of the Messenger of God. We want to enter into the Hadra of God, Azza wa Jal. Do it holding to the hand of the Beloved, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Zandaqa is heresy. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and it's actually stronger than that. I mean, uh, heresy is the best I can do, but Zandaqa is a hard word to translate. Heterodox? Huh? Heterodox? No, no, not heterodox, no. Heterodoxy can be okay. You know, Zandaqa is never okay. Um, anyway to leave aside the obligatory acts of worship is zandaqa. Say, I have attained the ultimate, I don't have to pray, I don't have to fast. Have you ever met people like that? We know people like that. Unfortunately, hundreds of them, thousands of them, they don't pray and they don't fast. And they think they're great Sufis. No, you're not. You're not even goofy Sufis. You know, you are worse than that. It is zandaqa. To commit the mahdhurat, to do the forbidden things, is disobedience. That's Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. And uh, let's take a word of the great Imam, one of the pillars of Egypt, of the great awliya you have here. Al-Badawi, Al-Dusuqi, and so many others, but Imam Abu Hassan, Al-Shadili, Allah be pleased with him. And he says, if your kashf goes against the book and the sunnah, then hold to the book and the sunnah and leave your kashf aside. Leave it alone. So this is their refrain, and I just wanted to give you uh, some examples of that. So the problem with Sufism was not internal. Maybe that's not the best way to put this, but the problem with Sufism um, is not with Sufism itself, but with those who violate it in its name. The false Sufi, the charlatan. These are the problem and they are the biggest problem of all. Let's be honest. And when we see people um, in our community who don't like Sufis, who are allergic to them, who have stigma against them, uh, give them a break. You know, um, if you had seen, maybe you have, some of the stuff they do, maybe you'd be like that too. I know people who come from Sufi families and who hate Sufism. They won't allow you to even mention the word. And why? Because of the hypocrisy they saw in their own family among people who were regarded to be sheikhs. And they just said, I'm out of here. I've got nothing to do with this. <clears throat> Sufism was a reality that had, a, had no name. It became a name with no reality. And those people who adopted the name for themselves and said, we're Sufis, and they don't have the reality, they are a problem. And they have been a problem for over a thousand years. And they were warned against from the very beginning of the writing of what we could call Sufi literature. <clears throat> One of the things we can say about the Sufis, they follow the law. 
otherwise they're not Sufis, but they also tend to be traditional and to be conservative. It doesn't mean that they can't adopt to the times, and it doesn't mean that they can't do amazing things, but they do tend to be very traditional, and they do tend to be conservative. In fact, some of the practices that are associated with them have nothing to do with Sufism as such, and they're not practiced universally. But things like tawassul, istighatha, uh, the visiting of graves, the maulid, and so forth, um, these are all things that were universal in the Muslim Ummah. In other words, it wasn't the Sufis who did this, it, everybody did that. And they were reg regarded to be essentially issues of law, of fiqh. And so the whole question is, is it mubah, is it not mubah? Is it wajib, is it um, makruh, is it mandub, what is it? But uh, th the Sufis will do things like this, but that's not what Sufism is, and it shouldn't be identified with that. And all of these things and other practices as well, they must meet the right conditions. They must be done correctly. And again, when things like that are done, for example, the visiting of graves is something mashru'a. You go there and recite a fati for them and so forth. But there are things that should not be done there. And this is why when you have the maqamat of the awliya, you have the graves of the great awliya, uh, it is a legal obligation in the sharia to have scholars there who indicate to the people what they can do, what they can't do. And in some countries, like in Uzbekistan, to my experience in Jordan, um, I, you know, I can think of some other examples in Algeria and so forth, in the old Algeria, which I visited before the trouble, where uh, you'll have people there to make sure that everything is done correctly. That's the way it should be. You don't want any nonsense to go on there. And often, without any question, you can go to the maqams of great saints in places like India, for example, and see horrors, absolute horrors. And sometimes you'll see the place is actually okay. There's nothing going on wrong there. But these things have to always be kept clean. They've got to be kept right. Also, there are certain things that have changed. In, in the Qadri path, for example, uh, what is called the Hadra by certain people, was introduced by some of our sheikhs in the jihad of Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jazairi. And, you know, but their hadra was exercise for war with dhikr. It wasn't what some people who took it made it to be later. And I'm not going to get into whether that's mubah or not mubah. But the thing is, is that often these things will change. And then there are things that are sometimes associated with Sufis that were never right to begin with, like snake charming, or even things like walking on fire, or putting, sticking weapons into yourself and not being wounded. Um, basically, any sorcerer can do that. Uh, sorcerers can charm snakes, and they can put themselves in the ground covered by coals and come out all right. Th that's really got nothing to do with anything of any va great value. Um, so, now, what I would like to do um, as we conclude this chapter of following the law and the Qur'an and the Sunnah is um, to stress the fact, the principle, that in Sufism you have the harmonious blending or joining together of the outward and the inward. The bringing together of al-zahir wal batin done harmoniously. This is one of the characteristics of Ahlul Haq. They bring the zahir and the batin together. And as we heard in the quotation of Shaykh uh, Ibn Alawi, which we're going to come back to in a minute, um, you should live in both presences. You should be familiar with the world of the inward and the outward and not one of them should destroy or harm the others. Okay, so we want our feet to be firmly planted in both presences. Fil hadratayn, fil hadratayn, al-zahir wal-batin. 
Let's look again at that quotation that we had yesterday at the end of the lesson by the great Sheikh Ahmed uh, ibn Ulaywa or Alawi of the 20th century. <clears throat> and I'm going to read the whole quotation because I love it so much. I also do like to read. Uh, I prefer that to actually his speaking. But he says, as for the perfected ones, meaning the great masters of the path, it is known from their sayings far and wide that the ultimate reality, al-haqiqah, can never be separated from the sharia, from the religious law, or vice versa. The religious law can never be separated from the haqiqah. So you have to have these two hadras. You have to have these two presences. He said, among these statements of theirs is the statement that whoever realizes, uh, let's just put this in Arabic, man tahaqqaqa wa lam tazandaq. That whoever lives by, whoever imbibes the haqiqa, but doesn't live by the sharia, becomes a zindiq. And zindiq is worse than a munafiq. Wa man, um, but whoever lives by the outward law only, the sharia, and doesn't taste the haqiqah, becomes a fasiq, becomes a deviant. In my somewhat strange translation yesterday, I said profligate, okay, to get, um, to get a star. Okay, so give me a star. Okay, also among their sayings is the <laughs> adage that the ultimate reality, al-haqiqah, is hidden within the sharia like butter is hidden in milk. You milk the cow, and then where do you get the butter from? You have to turn the milk, and then you get the butter. So the haqiqah is in the sharia like butter is in the milk, but he says, You've got to churn the milk. Have any of you ever done that? I have also. As a boy, we used to milk cows, and we used to squirt each other as we milked the cows, and uh, then we take it and churn it. And when you turn the butter, it's easy in the beginning, and it's really hard at the end, right? So this is also a beautiful metaphor, because... Don't think that the Sufi path is easy. The turning is easier in the beginning than it is at the end. You know, this is a path that uh, goes higher and higher and higher. <clears throat> and then he says here, those who have true knowledge of God are not veiled by the outward aspects of things from their inward realities. Nor are they veiled from the inward realities of things from their outward aspects. The Vahir doesn't veil the Baltan, and the Baltan doesn't uh, annul the Vahir. The outward utterance of speech, for example, does not veil them from its meaning nor does the meaning veil them from the outward utterance. Their feet are firmly planted within both presences, the outward and the inward. So this is a principle. This is a very important principle. And in Islam, <clears throat> we talk about different types of bid'ah. And we're talking here about bad bid'ah, Okay, so there are two generic types of bid'ah that are bad. And one of those is the exoteric bid'ah. Here, al-bid'atul zahiriyya. This is the bid'ah when we regard everything to be zahir, and there is no batin. Okay, so for example... Um, you know, 
من كان هجرته كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله. Okay, whoever makes their pilgr their, their uh, migration for God and His Messenger, their migration is for God and their Messenger. Okay, that's a historical fact. And this is about the Hijrah to Medina. But the Sufis will use that also for you on your path. That are you doing this for the sake of God and His Messenger? Or for a woman you're going to marry? Or dunya that you're going to get? See, so they will do what's called ishara. They will look at the, they will take this hadith also as an illusion, not illusion, illusion, an ishara to this reality. Okay, and that's part of the bottom of the text. It's part of the bottom of the text, the inward. So, um, exotericism is when you reject that. And in fact, I remember once I was teaching the hikam of Ibn Allah in a mosque and um, I was teaching it to people like you beautiful people and um, I actually was talking about an illusion, an ishara, using that hadith. And behind one of the pillars was a man who was quite exoteric and he was outraged and he said, what did you say? And it's like, I didn't know you were hiding, Satan. I didn't know you were there in hiding, you know. But he came out and uh, he just said, like, this is absurd. You cannot say that. You have no right. And, uh, you know, it's like, I just said, I'm going to look behind the pillars before I ever teach this again. <clears throat> you know, but, um, you know, exotericism is a bid'ah. Okay, and that is the denial of the esoteric. The denial of the ultimate realities that are in these truths. So we do not accept exotericism, or if you will, absolute exotericism. We must reject any exotericism that claims to be self-sufficient and to comprise within its narrow compass all that we require to respond to in divine revelation. Okay, can I say that again? Because I like that. <laughs> this is why I like to read too, because you know, you can work on what you say. And... Okay, so we must reject any exotericism that claims to be self-sufficient and to comprise within its narrow compass, its narrow boundaries, all that we require to respond to divine revelation. Okay, that's not enough. The exoteric will never be enough. This is why The people who will live just by the law, they will become fasik. And could you think of some examples of that? I mean, look at people today who blow themselves up and kill innocent people. These tend to be exoterics. They're dhahiris for the most part. And um, for them, the Sharia is really just qushur. And then they end up doing things that no human being with a heart would ever do. They themselves wouldn't have done this so many years ago before they were corrupted by their own teaching. And at the same time, you have another generic bid'ah. And this is al-bid'ah al-batiniyah which is esotericism, meaning absolute esotericism. So that's also an innovation. And one of the things that we get in our tradition is a statement that I found in Al-Qadi Iyad, you know, in, um, what's the name of his great biography of the Maliki Fuqaha? No, his great biography, what is it? Um, forgive me, I can't remember it. Um, Pray that God strengthens my memory. I often forget these things. But um, Al-Qadi Iyad, he says that two great salihs, you know, there are two great upright men who were tried by Ahlul Bid'ah because Ahlul Bid'ah were inclined towards them. Ja'far al-Sadiq and Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And Imam al-Shatibi explains this. And he says that Jafar al-Sadiq, who was an Imam, and one of the greatest who ever was, 
and who is a follower of the Sunnah. But he was, tri his tribulation was uh, the people of esoteric bid'ah. Ahlul bid'at al Okay, so they take from him things that actually is not what he's saying. And they put things in there also. And the other one is Ahmed ibn Hanbal. And his tribulation was with uh, the people of Vahiri Bid'a, who will reduce his teaching whenever they can to an exoteric teaching. But that's not what it is for him at all. He is one of the masters of the outward and the inward in every way, as his school is too. So we also do not accept any absolute esotericism. Here another quotation. <clears throat> We must reject any esotericism that claims to be self-sufficient and to embrace within its vast compass all that we require to respond to the divine revelation. Because esotericism is vast. It is an ocean and you will drown in that ocean unless you have Noah's Ark. And Noah's Ark is the Sharia. You've got to have that. So, in Islam, uh, and this is true of Islam, but it's especially true of the Sufis, the Zahir and the Baltan come together harmoniously so that the Zahir will never be used to overthrow the Baltan, nor will the Baltan be ever used to overthrow the Zahir. But they will both live in harmony, complementing each other. Mm. And in this, the Zahir has a special right. Because the Zahir, which is the outward aspect of the law, is the common denominator. And what do we mean by that, brothers and sisters? We mean by that that the Zahir is the thing that all of us can relate to, and that all of us do. So therefore, it's what we all have in common. And the kind of things that the Sufis may talk about, their allusions and so forth, again, there are people who can't understand them, like the man who was hiding behind the pillar. And it, really, he couldn't get it. And you could explain it to him, you know, half a dozen different ways. And it just won't compute. Okay, so the best thing, and this is why it made me really unhappy, because we don't want to be a fitna for him. We were at the same place and we were having a, a wonderful time together and, you know, now he's outraged because he heard that statement. So, to me, that's a big mistake I made. I made because we don't want to fight. And, like, if you can't understand this, maybe you're not capable of understanding it. You know, people are at different levels. But, therefore, the Zahir, though, does have a priority because it's the common denominator. It's what we all can understand. The Baltan is not that way. The Baltan is not that way. Some people will get it and others will not. <clears throat> and you must speak to people according to the level of their intellect. Um, so, uh, for this reason also, one of the rules of Tasawwuf, um, you know, is the fact that... Um, the objections of the fuqaha must always be respected. You know, that what, what, anything the Sufis do that the fuqaha don't like, uh, they have to pay attention to the faqih. And people like Zarruq, may God be pleased with him, will even say they've got to do what he says. He's the boss. Okay, so now we're in our second hour. We're not doing extremely well. We're not making the kind of progress that we need to make to finish our lecture for today. <clears throat> but, um, you know... Sorry? Ah, Tertib al madari Thank you. That's the book of Al-Qadi Iyam. Tertib al madari which is rich. It's full of all kinds of beautiful things. So, now we want to say a few words about the people who pervert the reality of Ihsan under the cover of a beautiful name, Sufism, the false 
Sufi. Okay, we, want to, we have to talk about that. And again, who warns us about the false Sufis? The Sufis. They are the ones that do that. And here, um, I want to begin with a quotation from the great Wali of Allah, Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi. God be pleased with him of the third century. Of the third century. And, excuse me, as I, I'm, I'm putting things in my mind map, so excuse me as I do that. Okay, so Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi, this is what he said. Um, let's take some beautiful things from him, first of all, then we'll come to a warning he makes. He said, the sons of the world are served by slaves and slave girls. The sons of the hereafter are served by the abrar and the ahrar. So, he, who are the slaves of the hereafter, the sons of the hereafter? Inshallah, people like you. People who believe in the hereafter and they live for the hereafter. And um, the Sufis are like that. And again, Imam al-Ghazali <coughs> would say that no one deserves the term alim or alima unless they are ulama al-akhirah. You know, the fact that you memorize Bukhari, <coughs> this doesn't make you an alim if you don't know and believe and show and practice that you know and believe that the next world is better and more lasting than this one. So those are the people we call the sons and daughters of the hereafter. And to be an alim, that's the first essential requirement. You must know that the hereafter is true, absolutely true, more real than this world, this beautiful world that we live in, and that it is better and more lasting than this world. Okay, and so he says that the sons, and let's say sons and daughters of the hereafter, are served by the righteous and by the free, the ahrar. And we use this word ahrar, the hur and the hurra in Arabic, to mean men and women of principle and integrity, who are bound by integrity and principle and therefore free of all hypocrisy and free of anything uh, below them. That's the ahrar. So they're the best of people, the people of the hereafter. May God make us among them. And he said, whoever finds his wealth in what he earns is forever poor. Whoever finds his wealth in what he earns is forever poor, even if he or she is a millionaire. Whoever finds his wealth in his heart is forever rich. May we be people that find our richness in our heart, and may God bless us in this world, and let us succeed in business and investment and all the things that we do. And if you have wealth, may he give you twice as much, three times as much, but make it pure and put it in your hand and not in your heart. Whoever seeks his needs in created things, let's say, whoever seeks the fulfillment of his needs in created things will be forever mahroom, forever cut off. Seek the fulfillment of your needs in the Creator and you will always be a winner. I added that part. <laughs> okay, so these are the words of warning of the great Shaykh Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi. Allah be pleased with him. Avoid the company of three types of people. The heedless scholar, the hypocritical Qur'an reciter, and the ignorant pretender, and the ignorant pretenders to Sufism. So he's a Sufi. He is. But he said, beware of three people. And they talk about this. Many of them talk about this same thing. If they put them in order of danger, who is the most dangerous of all people? It's the ignorant Sufi pretender. The false Sufi, especially the false Sheikh. He is Satan's number one 
ally. And the trauma that he causes you, most people can never recover from in their whole life. And he can destroy a whole generation and generations. And we know this from the Sufis. We know this from the Sufis. And that's why also in their path, one of the things they teach us about is the false sheikh. What makes a false sheikh? How do you beware of the false sheikh? He is dangerous. He is Satan's biggest tool on the face of the earth. And after him comes the false scholar. Here he says heedless scholar, which is nice, you know, but it's, a heedless scholar is nice because he's ghathal. But it's like he hurts people, the abusive scholar. He hurts people and he causes trauma. But his trauma is second to that of the false sheikh. And his trauma can ruin you. And number three is the hypocritical Qur'an reciter. And he's also traumatic. And uh, trauma in Greek means wound, trauma. But it's a wound that does not heal. And um, we get wounded all the time. But when your wound heals, inshallah, you'll be okay. In fact, Rumi says the light enters you through the wound. Okay, so you've got a big wound, you've got a big door of light. But the trauma is different. The trauma never heals. The trauma never heals. It festers and festers. So light doesn't come through it. Darkness does. Darkness does. And again, the most traumatic of all people, more traumatic even than the abusive father, or the abusive uncle, or the abusive teacher, in school is the false Sufi Sheikh number one and the false scholar and the hypocritical Quran reciter. Um, we could talk about ugly stories but that's not the best thing to do and we don't have all the time in the world but I know a woman from Ahlul Bayt who is a saint without any question and she went to learn Qur'an from a beautiful Qur'an reciter, male. And he's so good and so pious and his voice is so beautiful. And then he tried to seduce her. So what happens to her then? God saved her, even though she was attracted to him, to tell you the truth. You know, she was. But then now it's like, Every time she recites the Qur'an, she's hearing this hypocrite. And again, one of the reasons why she was almost destroyed by this is because he's such a scholar. And he studied Qur'an, and he knows this and he knows that. Okay, so these are shayateen. And these are wolves that are wearing the uh, you know, sheepskins. They're not sheep. So, um, here we have to make a few points, and this is very important. Uh, the prophets, are, in, the prophets are, fa are, are infallible, right? This is what we know. Uh, the prophets, uh, I'm going to just put that in, are infallible. Okay, we said before, the prophets have to be, they have to appear outwardly. Okay, awliya don't do that. They don't like to do that. They don't do that unless they have to. Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani remained essentially unknown until he was in his late 50s. And then God made him appear. Other awliya, they say, you've got to appear. You've got to teach. Why? How? How can I do that? Okay, often they have to be threatened by the Prophet ﷺ in dreams that you've got to appear, you've got to teach. But the prophets are infallible. Everyone knows that, right? Well, the awliya are not infallible. Not infallible. That's a qa'idah. So never forget it. <clears throat> and don't treat them as if they were infallible. We honor them, we love them, we respect them. But don't take them as if they were prophets. 
and uh, understand that they are as human in their fallibility as you and I. The awliya are not lawgivers, nor are they law takers. They cannot change the law or abolish the law. And the awliya are bound by the law. As we said before, to repeat, guidance requires limits, borders, guidelines, fixed principles. Not everything is fixed, but there's got to be goalposts that don't move. And the awliya have to have this too. And they get it from what? The sharia. The lawless, um, to use the big Greek word antinomian, okay, that means opposed to the law. The lawless antinomian Sufi is by definition no Sufi at all. Okay. Um, the lawless antinomian Sufi who commits adultery, who drinks, who eats the haram, you know, who does whatever he or she wants to do, they represent a total rupture in the balance between the Qur'an and the Sunnah. <clears throat> uh, if not, an outright rejection of everything normative Islam stands for. So, you beware of them. And again, they are the ones who give Sufism the bad name because they claim it for themselves. The Sufi won't do that. He won't say, I'm, I'm a Sufi. The Shaykhs won't even say, I'm a Shaykh. And they will say, I'm still at the beginning. Okay, he won't say that. He will say, I'm a Sahib al Zaman. Okay, I am the man of the time, the biggest wali on God's earth. Okay, and we had one like that that crashed last year who had thousands of followers committing adultery with women followers in Medina, in his hotel room, as people were outside the room waiting in line. True, he did that. Khabith. Khabith. Sahib al-Zaman. He's a wali of awliya Allah. Awliya shaitan. One of the awliya of shaitan. Okay? These are khubatha. Khubatha. Mal'unun. Mal'unun. Okay? So, uh, but that does happen. That does happen. So beware and don't let it happen. And don't be taken in by that, ever. You know, um, this is very, very important. And every human being has a forelock, metaphorically. You know, horses have forelocks, the nausea. And those of you who know about horses, you know that if you're a horse woman or a horse man, if you take the horse by its forelock, you can do anything with that horse. You can even throw it to the ground, even though it's a powerful, beautiful horse. So you have a forelock, and actually you have handholds, psychological handholds. The false sheikh is usually the master of grabbing the forelocks and the false handholds. And that's why once he's got you, you're not going to get away without ripping your forelock off or pulling out your handhold. And that hurts. And that creates a wound that may not ever heal. And I know men and women who were so traumatized by charlatans that they could never take a real spiritual guide for the rest of their lives, even though they met them, but they just couldn't see them. They just couldn't take from them. So this is very, very serious, very serious, brothers and sisters. The, tri the, the true Sufi has signs, and the true Sheikh has signs, and you know we might talk about that more as we go, but they are people of service. The true sheikh is a khadim. Okay, not makhdum, khadim. The prophet, was he makhdum? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The prophet fixed his own shoes. He worked in his own house. You know, he helped his wives with everything. You know, he didn't say, bring me this, bring me that. Do this for me, do this for that. He was in the service of his ummah day and night. And when we are all khadims and the people of the path, every one of them should be a khadim. 
And when we are khadims on the path, there's no problem that we cannot solve. But when we are makhdum, there's no problem we can solve. So they are people of khidmah, they are people of love, and they love the poor, and they love the needy, and they love children, okay, and they love creation in general. They are people of extreme adab, extreme courtesy, and they are people who follow the sharia. You knew that one. And they are people who have no claims. They're not the makers, Ana sahib al-zaman, I am the great sheikh, and so forth. You know, really, that's not who they are. And uh, I've had the honor to know people like that in my life, I believe. You know, but they never said that to me. And one of the <coughs> greatest that I was with for 19 years, other people would tell me whom I trust, who were sheikhs, they would say, this is a murabbi, hold to him. Do you think he would ever tell me that? Not on your life. He said, ana akhuka fil Islam. You know, and this deen is just nasiha. Okay, they are not makers of claims. Beware of the maker of claims. And therefore, they are people of the prophetic inheritance. Bi'izni lahi ta'ala. So there are shuyukh and there are muluk. <laughs> there are sheikhs and there are kings. Okay, um, I have nothing against political kings, by the way. I like the king of Morocco and I like the king of Jordan and I like the kings of Africa, okay, the royal families of Africa and of Nusantara, you know, of the great archipelago of Indonesia, Malaysia, <laughs> Singapore, Brunei, the Philippines. I'm romantic, right? <laughs> but I don't like Sufi kings. And I've seen them, actually, I have. And I've seen these kings, false sheikhs, who turn entire villages into zombies. With sorcery, by the way, in this case. And they use them just to get anything they want. In fact, when he comes into the village, he will even say, um, you have to give him his sheep, and uh, you don't give him a female sheep, it's got to be a male sheep. Uh, why? Yeah, do you, can you, when you eat your sheep, can you tell this was a female or a male? Doesn't it taste about the same? No, but the male sheep is more expensive. And you don't sacrifice it, his cooks will sacrifice it. And he will take from you whatever little money you have. And if he sees a woman he'd like to marry, well, who is to stop him? Okay, the shayateen, muluk, that's what they are. And I've seen villages turned into zombies by people like this. In Senegal, that's where I've seen them, in Senegal. And there's other places where that happens as well. Okay, what good is that? That is evil, evil to the nth degree. So there are shuyukh and there are muluk. Look for the shuyukh and beware of the muluk. Again, the Sufis were, and they must forever remain, their biggest critics, their own biggest critics. We have to clean up our house. Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, that's one of the things he does, is clean up the house, wash the dirty laundry, you know, uh, get this thing the way it ought to be. And uh, we have to do that. So it's an obligation of fard, ayn that you protect yourself from the charlatan. And we're told that it is a major sin to follow one. Um, meaning by that, not to have exercised what we could say due diligence. You know, that check out this person. You know, know who this person is. And just because he has a big turban and a big beard, and just because, you know, he looks photogenic. Okay, that doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean a thing. Okay? Um, use your brain. Look for the signs. And um, again, he's got to be a person of adab. One of the ways that you can tell whether a person is a person of adab is to be rude to them. If it's a person of adab, he'll respond really sweetly. 
And if he's not, ooh, you've got a lion, you've got a tiger by the tail. So God protect us, and God protect us again and again and again. Okay, so with that, we've begun a major introduction. Well, let's not say introduction. We've begun a major part, which is Quran and Sunnah, Sharia, and Haqiqah, the, 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 the true Shaykh and the false Shaykh. All that goes together. Now we want to begin to talk about some other things, and tonight what I want to talk about is um, that Sufism is many things. Uh, Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani said what? As-sidqu ma'al haqq wa husnul khuliqi ma'al khalq. It is truthfulness with God, al-haqq, and good character with creation. Okay, but Sufism is many things. Uh, Al-Qutb al-Dirdir, may God be pleased with him, he says that at Sufism is ilmun, yu'arafu bihi salamatu sadri wal hawas. They, they have incredible definitions. That it is a science by which you know the soundness of the heart and all of the senses. Meaning even the sense of smell, of touch, of taste, of hearing, and of seeing. And meaning also the inner senses of khayal and imagination and so forth. Okay, that, I love that definition. But uh, tonight we want to talk about the fact that one of the essentials of Sufism is adab. Courtesy, courtesy, courtesy. Service, day and night. Khidma, khidma, khidma and love. Mahabba, love of God, love of the Prophet, love of creation, love of your enemy even. And then Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani, he would say, as lillah, at li. He would say, the righteous belong to God. They're for God. They don't need me. But at-talihun, the unrighteous, they're mine. Give them to me. That's what he would say. So, um, this is love. Love. And he will set them right. He will set them right, bi ta'ala. So, let's take a few quotations. Um, first of all, Al-Fudayl ibn Iyab, may God be pleased with him. This is one of the earliest Sufis, and he is of the second century, which is the ninth century of the common. He died in eight, 803, and um, he was a Robin Hood. He was uh, bad news, and uh, he used to rob people, and he did other things. And uh, then one night, um, it all changed. I think this was the verse he heard. heard. Isn't it not time for those who believe that their skin finally move with the dhikr of Allah? And he said, his skin moved. And he said, yes it is, I do toba. And he did big toba. And then he gave back the money he had stolen and other things that he'd done. And he got people's pardon. And he began a new life. And he became one of the greatest of them all one of the greatest of the Salaf. But Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad, may God be pleased with him, he says, none of those among us attained what they attained through abundant prayer and fasting. We talked about this yesterday, but I'm going to repeat it. And I'm going to repeat it again tomorrow. Um, I'm going to repeat it at least three or four times. Um, rather, they attained it through what? Sakha'un nafs, overflowing generosity of the soul. And I'm sure there's not a person here who is not generous with your pocketbook. Okay, and we just came back from China and these incredible Chinese Muslims, my God. And they are so generous, it is embarrassing. You know, it really, they are so, and so humble. You know, I mean, subhanAllah, I've, I've never seen anything quite like it. These incredible Chinese Muslims, mashallah. But, over, but to be generous with your soul, that's not easy. To give somebody a dollar or a thousand dollars, a thousand dollars, not so easy, but, you know, depending on how much you've got in the bank. 
you know, but uh, to be generous with your soul, that is not easy. Sakha un nafs, generosity, overflowing generosity of the soul. Wasalamatu sadr, soundness of the heart. No envy, no hatred, no jealousy, no rancor, no doubt. Your, your heart is sound, no shubahat. When nusuhu lil ummah, and giving sincere advice to the ummah. And we could say to al khalq, to all people. Okay, so that's good adab, isn't it? Uh, Sari al Sakati, who is the maternal uncle of Imam al Junaid, he said, um, Your most powerful accomplishment is when you overcome your nafs. Okay, brothers and sisters, that's adab. And it's not when you lifted uh, so many pounds or when you you know, did other things. No, it's when you overcame you. You overcame your anger, you overcame your passion. And then you'll have adab. Whoever is unable to make his nafs have adab will be even more incapable, ajas, of having adab with others. You see, uh, we have to have adab with each other. How can I have adab with you if I can't have adab with me? How can I have adab with you if I can't control myself? And then he says, um, whoever fears God, everything fears him. Whoever fears God, everything fears him. Again, as they say, creation serves them. Creation does serve the awliya. But if you go down the path of the awliya to be served, you took a detour. You're not going to make it. It's an amazing thing. Abu Hafs, Amr ibn Salam and Naysapuri. I love him. I love them all. Maftoon bi mahabbatihim. But Abu Hafs, I love him because he's the one they say, what is a Sufi? And he said, the Sufi is the one who doesn't ask what is a Sufi. <laughs> I like that. But in any case, uh, he said, um, he said, Sufism is all adab. It is all different types of adab. Every waqt has an adab. Every time has its adab. This is profound and it's true. Every maqam has its adab. Every station has its adab. Whoever holds to the adab of the awqat, to the proper adabs of the time, and the maqamat will attain mablagh ar-rijal. They will attain the attainment of the men of God. And by the way, rijal, men of God, is not gender specific. You know, it's, it's, it, they use this word rijal for the awliya, the big awliya, whether they are men or women. By the way, the role of women in Sufism is extremely prominent. And the things the Sufis say about women, maybe I'll have a chance to tell you some of the things they say about women. women. Incredible. Incredible. They talk about the power of women, the strength of women, and that a woman can be worth 40 men. And they have beautiful proofs of that, by the way, which I'm not going to mention right now. Um, you know, but I might later. And... Um, you know, mashallah, they, they're, really, they're really, and even they say that you, if you're going to be a complete wali, you've got to learn to call upon Allah with the voice of a woman, with a woman's voice. Okay, so he says that um, whoever loses or misuses their adab, there are different types of adab, will be far away in the very place that he be, believes to be close. He will be far away from God in the very thing in which he believes he is close to God. And mardud, he will be rejected in the very place where he hopes for acceptance. This is the curse of abandoning, abandoning adab. You have to have it. Imam al-Junaid, may Allah be pleased with him, 
Again, he says, like Al Fudayl, and what Fudayl said is also in a hadith which I'm going to mention to you when we come to the awliya. But Al Junaid said, Sufism is not attained by much prayer and fasting. The same. Rather, it is soundness of the heart and generosity of the soul. And, um, okay, that's what he says. And Nuri, who is one of the great awliya of the time of Al Junaid, both of them taught Sufism is not made up of practices and types of knowledge. It is the qualities of good character. Whoever surpasses you in qualities of good character surpasses you in Sufism. Uh, and Nuri, who I just mentioned, and Nuri, he died in 907, 294, at the end of the 3rd century, beginning of the 10th century. Um, he says that whoever surpasses you in adab surpasses you in Sufism. I just read that, but he says that. And he says, um, well, anyway, I'm not going to read that again. I said that. al Katani. Uh, this is al Katani, who was at the 4th century. He is Abu Bakr Muhammad ibn Ali al Katani, died in the 4th century and the 10th century. He said, Sufism is khuluq. It is good character. Whoever surpasses you, zada alayka fil khuluq, zada alayka fil tasawwuf. Whoever surpasses you in good character, they surpass you in tasawwuf. Um, okay. Um, Yahya ibn Mu'adh al-Razi, whom we just had a few minutes ago. Um, he's called al-Wa'idh, by the way. He's called the admonitioner, the preacher. He said, one mustard seed of love is better than 70 years of worship without love. One mustard seed of love is worth more than 70 wor years of worship without love. You know, you want to worship God, but you want to love, worship God because you're in love with Him. And with His Prophet. And let's take uh, the great poet, uh, he's called Sana'i, Sana'i, he's one of the great Persian poets, he died in the 12th century. And he said, whoever agrees with the Yazid in his nafs, how could he ever know the station of Abu Yazid? That's really beautiful. Uh, Abu Yazid al-Bastami is one of the greatest ones. And of course, Yazid is the son of Mu'awiyah. And so he said, your nafs is a Yazid. Your nafs is worse than shaitan. So whoever agrees with the Yazid in himself, how could you even understand? How could you even begin to think you could understand the maqamat of Bayazid, of Abu Yazid al-Bistami? Now, um, let me see. I think we have 15 minutes. My goodness. Anyway, I think I'm going to make it. Nope. Nope. I thought I was going to make it, but that's okay. So, let's say a few general things about adab, courtesy, service, and love. And our path is courtesy, service, and love. First of all, these are the essence of ihsan. Ihsan, moral perfection that you worship God as if you could see Him. The essence of that is love, service, and adab. Husn al-mu'amala, to deal with other people and other things in a good way, and to keep the hukuq of Allah, the hukuq of the ibad. Okay, and in Islam we have hukuq Allah, the rights of God. We have hukuq al-ibad, the rights of God's servants. And we have hukuq al-hayawanat wal baha'im, the rights of animals as well. Okay, so adab is keeping all of those rights, all of those rights, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. And of course, it's, all of this is good character. Um, good character has two basic elements. So let's just get what they are right now. Um, what are the two basic elements of good character? Do you know? 
Okay, I thought you did know. Okay, but, of course, good character is a thousand things, right? Generosity, truthfulness, trustworthiness, um, chastity, um, modesty, bravery, courage. But all types of good character go back to two elements. And they are humility and the love of others. All good character goes back to humility, tawadra, putting, regarding yourself to be below others, and regarding others to be above you. Whether it's a child, whether it's an ignorant man, whether it's a poor woman, whoever it may be, but all good character is like that. It is humility and we could call it altruism, although the train might derail, um, especially among my country, men and women. Uh, we don't necessarily use the kind of English that they use in Oxford or Cambridge. But altruism, which is the love of the other, that is the essence of good character. So again, courtesy, service, love, they come out of that. Humility and exalting the other, whoever that other may be. <clears throat> Um, the greatest sheikhs of the past, they always preferred each other over themselves, not to mention people in general. Today, often we say they prefer themselves over everybody. And ubudiyya, which is one of the quests of the path, servitude, the, the sense of true servitude towards God, that comes from service and love and adab. These produce obudiya. Obudiya requires adab, service, and love. Again, as we said, if you want to know who really has adab, there is a litmus test. Be rude to them. And if they have adab, you'll see they're, they're still very nice. And if they don't, you might get punched out, you know, but uh, they, they will respond in a different way. Um, we also say that in adab, <coughs> service, and love, there are three different stations. The first of them is cause no harm, okay? And um, bear the harm that comes to you. Okay, that's the first one. Don't harm other people. Don't abuse other people. But also, when you are harmed, when you are abused, try to bear it. And again, please don't misunderstand me. When abusive situations are not to be tolerated. So we're not saying just, you know, live in oppression. Live in tyranny, no. But as a rule, we want to bear, we want to bear the afflictions that come to us, especially if they come to us from ignorant people and things like that. And the second one is to benefit people by doing good. So the first one, don't harm, don't do that. And then bear. And then the other one is actively involve yourself in good. And then the third and highest is Irshad. Take the hands of the people and guide them to salvation from the fire and entrance into the doors of paradise. That's the highest level of service and love and adab. One of the things that's very important about adab, service and love is, of course, we have adab with the sheikh, but the adab's got to be with the murids. That's harder and more important, and it's got to be with your family. And that's harder even in most cases, and it's got to be with all creation. It's not just there with that man that you would be good to anyway. No, it's to be, have edib with the murids, have edib with the muridas, have edib with your family, have edib with your spouse and your children, and so forth. And... When we have adab, and when we serve and love creation, there's a miracle that happens. 
And that miracle is all creation becomes a sheikh for you. All creation becomes a sheikh for you. Not meaning that you're going to go to the drunk or to the abusive person and say, tell me what to do and do it. But what it means is you begin to get wisdom from everything you see, even from a drunk. Because there's wisdom in that and even from an ignorant person. And as we say, the bees make honey from all the flowers. So you're able to do that. Um, everything has a servant, we're told in our Sufi tradition. Uh, what is the servant of religion? It is adab, good behavior, courtesy, service, and love. That is the servant of religion. And like we said, we heard Yahya bin Mu'adh al-Razi, right? A mustard seed of love is worth 70 years of worship, a lifetime of worship without love. Through adab and love and service, the great Sufi masters brought to the masses and to all the people alike the living, intimate, and highly personal relationship to God that is the essence of Sufism and the love of the Prophet that they craved, by the way. This is what, this was the secret, you know, that this is why they were able to open the hearts that no one else could open. Um, so, to know the fullness, we're almost going to finish. I think we're going to be on time. Okay, maybe. Hmm? I know, well, I think we're going to be on time for questions. Uh, you want to know the truthfulness of your states. It's easy. Reflect on the correctness of your dealings with human beings. You have a high maqam. Are you a real Sufi? You prayed all night. You fasted all day. Do you want to know what your maqam is? Then how do you deal with other people? How is your mu'amala? Because that is what tells us who you are. I can pray all night and fast all day, but if I am a difficult person and an abusive person, I don't have any status at all. I could know all of Bukhari and all of Muslim, but if I am abusive, then I don't have a high st status at all. The path of adab, service, and love. Of course, you do do that. And how could you not do that? If you cannot love God's servants, if you cannot love your fellow human being, and you cannot serve him or her, and you cannot have adab with them, how can you serve the Creator who made them? How can you have adab with the Creator who made them? How can you love the Creator who made them? These all go together. If I love the Creator, I love the people He made. And I see His wisdom in making every one of them. Our Sufi tradition says, God is content to create the weak and fallible human being as His servant. Are you not content to make them your brothers and sisters? Beautiful, really. And again, we want to practice this. We want to grab this by the handle and make this our practice. Mm. Okay, so... Um, I think that's enough uh, here. At this point, I'm proud of myself. <laughs> I got done in time you know, to give you at least a couple of questions and uh, inshallah so we're finished with lesson two alhamdulillah and um, we have some questions from yesterday so Okay, so um, when we talked about the false shaykh, 
How do you identify him? Um, he is not an heir of the Prophet He is not humble. He is not generous. He is not giving. He doesn't serve you. You serve him. Um, he doesn't have adab. He can blow up at you at a minute. You know, kiss my hand, give me the money. He doesn't ask you for money. He doesn't ask you for these things. Okay, he follows the way of the Prophet He is the person most like the Prophet of anyone that you ever met. And he doesn't follow the Sharia. Okay, the, all of these, any of these are red lights. And therefore, if you see these things, again, the real Sheikh is kind. He serves you. He has adab. He doesn't blow up in your face. You know, he has no claims. The false sheikh is the opposite of that. He's the maker of claims. And they have the biggest egos on earth in many cases. Okay, and their variations and so forth. And the thing is, is that you don't have to turn them into the bureau of false sheikhs. Okay, but... Whenever you see the red light, then go look someplace else. But pay attention to the red lights. You know, that this man wants your money. You know, and we know people right now, you maybe know yourself. They want you to sign over your house to them if you become a murid. I know one like that. He took a man's car, his house. What is that? What is that? And, you know, so they have these signs. Um, the real sheikh brings people together. The false sheikh divides them. And um, the false sheikh can be many different types and varieties. But often they are cult masters. They are cult masters. And they do that in different ways. They do that in different ways. Um, I, I know one in particular who did that by keeping everybody poor except himself. He was rich. <coughs> but everybody around him was poor. And if you tried to make them rich, like by giving them jobs or bringing in money, uh, you'd be out of the community. That's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? But this is because he controlled them by making them totally dependent on him. So, the real sheikh, you have to follow him, you have to learn from him, but he wants to make you into a leader. And he wants to make you into a giant. And he wants to make you stand on your own feet. Um, he wants to empower and not to disempower. The false sheikh disempowers. And the false sheikh makes you dependent on him, usually. And uh, so they do these other things. And this is not the path. And um, I hope that will be enough. Inshallah, we'll come back to talk about the sheikh. And we'll talk about the murids. The murids also do a lot of bad things, by the way. And we'll talk about this, uh, if not tomorrow, the next day. But... You know, for example, you may have a good sheikh, but his murids turn him into something that you never heard about. They, he's the greatest, he's the only one, he's this, he's that. You know, they won't talk to people who don't go to him and so forth. So, we'll talk about these things in more detail later, the Ibn Lahi Ta'ala. <clears throat> This is a good question, and I find it also <clears throat> a difficult question. If the Sufi does not know whether his actions are accepted, is he not always living a life of inner anxiety? That's a really good question. Is this a paradox? This is a really good question. This is a brilliant question. Is there anybody here who knows if their actions have been accepted or not? Please raise your hand. All the Ramadans you fasted, 
Do you know, in fact, they were accepted? Please raise your hand. I'm not going to raise mine. Okay, so, in fact, none of us ever know that. And you have to live with that. Because you never know, were my actions accepted or not? And there are signs. When our actions are accepted, they are lifted up to heaven. So you don't see them anymore. And that's why usually people that are very conscious of how good they are, and how much they do, and how much they pray and fast, and how much thicker they do, um, they may not have been accepted. And the reason why is because their deeds are still down here on earth. They still remember them. And one of the things you see about your beautiful brothers and sisters who are awliya is that they often think they've never done a good thing. And they actually have done incredible things. But they don't remember. It's as if they don't remember. Because it's out of sight. God took it away. He accepted it. He accepted it. So, um, the good people, they don't actually believe they're so good. They don't actually believe they've done much. And this is a sign. So, anxiety. Um, Inna kunna qablu fi ahlina mushfiqeen. Right? These are the believers in paradise that we used to be in a state of anxiety in our families. What's going to happen to my children? What's going to happen to me? How are we going to educate them? This is the way we should be. We should be mushfiq. We should be concerned. We should be worried. Anxiety is one of these modern words that has all these existential connotations, you know, that modern psyches talk about and that they're afflicted with. So it's not the kind of word that I feel comfortable with. But the Sufis don't live in a state of anxiety. They live in a state of ishfaq, of concern. And it's said about Al-Hasan al-Basri, who was one of the greatest of the successors, and of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, who is one of the greatest of the successors, that both of them lived as if the fire had been created exclusively for them alone. So did he believe his actions were accepted? This was his greatness. And therefore the Sufi is in a state of constant iltirar. Constant iltirar. This is the, their inner geography. That they are in a state of constant dependence on God. And this is why their du'as are accepted. Because God will not reject the du'a of the mudtar, even if it's an idolater. Even if it's an atheist, the person who calls upon God in ittirar, God will accept them. And all of you know the story I'm going to tell. Because you, if you've been around me, you've heard it 30 times, 100. But this is back in the 1970s. That sounds to you like the Middle Ages. <laughs> to me, it was yesterday. And this was at the University of Michigan. I was a young professor there. And my wife was doing her work in graduate school, and so we were we were in, uh, in undergraduate school, and we were living in student housing, because I was a young professor, and whether you know it or not, young professors, especially in my country, are poor. They don't have any money, and I didn't have any money. But also, you know, my wife was in school, so we lived in university housing. It was very nice because we had Muslim graduate students around us. They were beautiful people. We had a great time. Those were great years. I'll never forget them. But we had with us there a woman who was a feminist, who's a divorced mother, has a little boy, and she was an atheist, and she could talk to you about the evil of religion day and night. And that's what she would do, too. And she loved to talk with us. So one beautiful spring day, we were out, 
and we were talking and she's talking about women and how women has never been in, in fact they say that even in the history of religion that women are the best friends of religion it's true women are the best friends that religion ever had but religion's not always been their best friend okay now she's talking and talking and her son is having a big time and he gets away and he goes between some cars that are parked on the street it's a narrow street and another car is coming down the street really fast and she looks at him just in time to see him killed by a car because that's what's going to happen and she said oh my god oh my god and the car slammed on its brakes and there was dust and crying and screaming and the little boy escaped by an inch of his life and he comes back to her running okay why? She's Mutarra. And that was Istiratha. She called upon God from the depths of her heart because that knowledge of God is there. God will not reject the prayer of the Mutar. So this is the secret of the Sufis, actually. They are in a constant state of Iltirar. And we say that the Sufis are like mountains and mountains don't need anchors. But the internal reality of them is they depend on God for every breath. This is their beauty and this is worshiping God as if you could see Him. And this is also, they are people who, they don't know that anything's been accepted. They have no claims whatsoever. And this is the secret of their goodness and this is what you and I and every believer should want to have, bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Well, that's a brilliant question, whoever wrote that question. The companions gave the Prophet bay'ah because he was infallible and was given direction from Allah himself through the Archangel Gabriel. How can we trust a fallible shaykh to be in charge of our heart? Uh, in any case, the issue of the shaykh we're going to begin to talk about tomorrow. And the issue of bay'ah, I don't think we'll talk about tomorrow. We might talk about it the day after tomorrow. Um, the Sufis never gave bay'ah. That will begin with Sultan al-Awliya, Shaykh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani. And that is a new stage in history. And of course the Prophet gave bay'ah, that's bay'ah al-Radwan. Inna ladhina yubayi'unaka inna ma yubayi'un Allah. Truly those who give you bay'ah, they're only giving it to God. Yadullahi fawqa aydihim. The hand of God is above their hand. The Prophet is infallible. No question about that. But that bay'ah to ridwan doesn't end with the Prophet. It is a major sunnah. Even in Muslim we have a hadith, um, you know, which you've probably heard, but, you know, it says that whoever dies without a bay'ah in their neck dies the death of jahiliyyah. Many political parties will use that hadith to make you give them bay'ah to support them in the election or in their project. Okay, But I don't like usually to mention that hadith because the language is so strong. But the bay'ah is a big thing in Islam. So that bay'ah of Ridwan goes to whom after the Prophet Wasallam. Abu Bakr. And then to whom? Umar. And then to whom? Uthman. And then to whom? Ali. And then to whom? Imam al-Hasan ibn Ali. He is the true recipient of that bay'ah. With no question. But he will turn it over to Muawiyah. God be pleased with them all. To save the blood of this ummah. And this is a big thing in history. And we will talk about that later. We won't go talk about it tonight. But um, Shaykh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, who is a Hassani, and he's a Husseini on his mother's side, uh, he is given the permission to give the bay'ah, but not politically. Not to be a master or a king or a khalifa, you know, but to create what will be called the tariqah as an order. So we're going to talk about this. Where do the Sufi orders come from? But that will be two lessons from now, inshallah. And there we can bring up the issue of the bay'ah. Okay, but in any case, um, um, 
the bay'ah is a very important sunnah, and you never obey a created being in disobedience to God. The bay'ah to no one, whether even if it was to, you know, Imam Ali, karam Allahu wajhahu, he would never command you to do anything against God's will. But even if, God forbid, that should happen, we wouldn't obey him in that. You cannot obey any created being in disobedience to God. <clears throat> While I understand that the science of Sufism isn't a bid'ah, where do the Mashayikh get the adhkar and their details? For example, the spe specific numbers of repetitions of those different types of dhikrs. Um, if the basis of Sufism is hadith and Qur'an, why do the practices of different turuq uh, differ? So that's also a very good question. Um, ihsan is an essential part of Islam. This we know and we've talked about extensively. Sufism is a created name that was created for the science of ihsan. Uh, where do the mashayikh get their adhkar and uh, their, the details of what they do? They get them from the Qur'an, they get them from the Sunnah, they get them from Ilham. And Imam al-Ghazali, and we'll talk about this later, hopefully. I hope we'll have time to get to this. But um, you have two sources of knowledge. You have knowledge that comes from the study of this world. And that can be spiritual knowledge also. And then you have knowledge that comes from inspiration, which we call ilham. And that comes from the purification of the soul. And in order to receive ilham, you have to purify your soul. And then you have to also know the rules by which you can distinguish between what is ilham and what is awham. And there are rules for that, by the way. And the Sufis will give you those rules. This is one of the most important things they study. And the khawatir, how do I know what's happening in my heart? And this is a science, brothers and sisters. It's very, very important. But the person in a state of ilham, they are receiving knowledge from a lawh al mahfuz And you sometimes, no doubt, receive knowledge from Allah al-Mahfuz. When? When you have a ru'ya as saliha When you have a true dream. And probably every single one of you has had them. And some of you have them a lot. Okay, so where do they come from? Allah al-Mahfuz. And sometimes they're symbolic and they have to be interpreted. And sometimes they or tafsili, they are detailed and they're so clear, they don't have to be interpreted. Okay? Um, God can show you all kinds of things, right? And they come to be true. And um, maybe you go to Mecca and before you go to Mecca for the first time, you see it in a dream. Now everybody sees it in photographs, so nobody needs dreams. But there are people that see it in dreams, and they go there and see it. You know, so, um, and this is one of the reasons why we want to, if we have enough time, later on, the fifth class, is actually supposed to be in the sixth and seventh, but those got cut off. But we want to talk about where do they get their knowledge, the knowledge that they have. So they get it from Ilham, and they have a whole science of how to deal with that knowledge. And that knowledge is something else. It is something else. And so the Prophet gave us numbers. Do this 33 times, 33 times, 33 times. Do this 10 times, 100 times. Okay, the Prophet also uses numbers. But the awliya, especially, you know, in the ilham that they get, they will learn things like the secrets of numbers. And... Um, they know what the numbers mean. And so they will also say, do this 200 times, 100 times, 111, 313, 17. 
Okay, and these numbers have symbolic value. Now the murid and the murida, the people like me, we attach to the numbers, you see. So we become the worshippers of numbers. And we're so proud that I did my numbers. And that you're not supposed to do. The numbers are to discipline the self, but the numbers are supposed to introduce you to the secrets of God, not the secrets of the numbers. But, for example, in the Wirt al-Asas, which we use as the foundational dhikr, you have 200 hasbunallah wa ni'mal 200 astaghfirullah al -Azim. Why 200? One reason is to tire you out and to break your nafs, to be dull, to break your nafs, although they are powerful, but not if you're worshipping the number. I got my 200, I'm finished. I can't get it finished in time. No, no. Slow down. You know, and uh, do it in the presence of God. I've never done that in my life. I always get done with the 200. Then 100, 100. So the numbers have secrets, but don't be the servant of the numbers. And many people are. And in fact, one of the signs of the great sheikhs is that um, they may not give you very much to do especially if you're a beginner because you're not ready for that yet and uh, often one of the things that happens on the path is that people do a lot of dhikr 20,000 times 4,000 times but they're not ready for that so what comes to them is taqa it is energy. It is not light. It is not light. And then they begin to see things and to do things and to say things. That those are awham. They are not ilham. And then sometimes they become lies. Okay? So, um, and this is one of the biggest things that goes wrong in the path. That you get people that get into the adhkar. And they do all kinds of afkar, but they're not ready for it. And out of that they get taqa, they, and they think it's light, but it's not light. It's energy. And the energy moves them and makes them speak. But actually it's just abham. And it might be also jathb. It can lead to jathb as well. And jathb can be good and bad, and we might talk about that later if we get time. But these people have access to special knowledge, and that's why, as Imam al-Ghazali said, um, whoever does not taste a portion of this knowledge, we fear for them a bad end. Su al khatima And, you know, if you look at the lives of our brothers and sisters, whom uh, you probably know a lot about, if we look at our husbands and wives, and we look at our families and our neighbors, the jealousies, the petty rivalries, the strategies. I mean, uh, sometimes children do amazing things. It's okay if they're children, but not if they grow up doing it. But it's games they play to hurt each other, to avenge themselves on each other. And they destroy themselves. And God protect them from a bad end. God protect them from a bad end. So we want a good end. But the least portion of this knowledge that saves you from a bad end and gives you much more than that is that you do taslim at tasdiqu wa taslimu li ahlihi that you believe in its people, meaning its authentic people, not its charlatans. And you distinguish between the two. And then you give them taslim, like Yahya bin Mu'adh, Abu Yazid al-Bistami, Imam al-Junaid, and all these great people. You can trust them. Wallahi, you can trust them. But they have access to knowledge, which is incredible. Incredible. Um, not to mention the fact that Abu Huraira, Allah be pleased with him, he told us in Sahih al-Bukhari and in other transmissions that the Prophet gave him two camel loads of hadith. Wiqrani, right? Two camel loads of hadith. 
One of them he teaches publicly, and the other one he wouldn't dare, because you would cut his throat. You would cut his throat. So there was a transmission that the Prophet gave to people like Abu Huraira that is not to be given to people in public. And what is that? Well, the hadith doesn't tell us. Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken in my bad memory of what he says, but he says it's the knowledge of the fitan. It's the knowledge of the fitan, of the bad rulers and the impostors that will come. You could say ashrat al -sa You could say the things that are going to happen through history. Because a lot of that, if you were to tell it, you would be in trouble. Especially if you were to tell it with authority. What about what the Prophet said about Yazid, for example? You think the, the, the Umayyads would be happy to hear that? So, no doubt that's part of it, but we also believe that it's another ilm, which is similar, but it's the knowledge of the big secrets, the haqqaiq, the ontological realities. In any case, this is a knowledge which is ontological and historical, and God knows best. Um, we have books in Islam that will talk about things like this, but usually we keep it a secret. And among the awliya, you have awliya, who know so much, and they wrote about over, over 200 years ago. In some cases, over 700 years ago. Talking about America, and talking about other things like that. Believe me, but those are secret books. And they are also part of that inheritance. And we believe that that inheritance is an inheritance that was given to the Sufis. أَحْبَبْتُ أَنْ أُعْرَفْ فَخَلَقْتُ الْخَلْقِ I loved, God said, that I be known, so I created creation. Is that in Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, Ibn Majah, and Nisa'i, Ahmed ibn Hanbal? Not to my knowledge. But all the Sufis say, that is Sahih. But it's from the other Camelot. So they are the heirs of that. And you have a hadith like um, hadith um, Jabr, when Jabr says to the Prophet وسلم, what was the first thing God created? The light of your Prophet Jabr. And sometimes these hadith will end up in other collections. So it's said that hadith Jabr is there, you know, in uh, Ibn Abi Shaiba, for example. And I was told that it's a good transmission, but I don't know that that's, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know. Sometimes hadith get out of that one into the other. Or sometimes the hadith are mixed so that you get a little bit of the one and the other. Such as the fact that God says that my servant does not approach me by anything more dear to me than what I have required of him. Fard, law. And he does not continue to draw closer by voluntary actions until I love him. And when I love him, I become the eye with which he sees, the ear with which he hears, the hand with which he grasps, the foot with which he walks. In some transmissions, the tongue with which he speaks, the fu'ad, the heart with which he perceives. Can you explain that to me? Can you? وَمَنْ أَذَلِي وَلِيًّا If he calls upon me, I will answer. And whoever offends one of my awliya, I declare war against. Sahih hadith. But this is a hadith that is actually from the other collection. But it's there in Bukhari and Muslim and others uh, because of the fact that it's got in it the importance of sharia. So that's why they have it there in that collection as well. Even though only the Sufis know what that means. And it doesn't mean that you become God or anything like that. But there are two transmissions in our prophetic legacy and in every one. And we believe the Sufis are the heirs of that second transmission. Okay, they talk about Autad, they talk about Abdal, they talk about these things. That goes back to the earliest hadith tradition. But it's those other hadith. <clears throat> it is not Sahih hadith that you'll find in Bukhari and Muslim. And I'll give you some examples of those. 
But the great muhaddis will say, the Prophet told us about the abdal, and about the awtad, and about the akhtab. But they know that's in the other transmission. It's not in Sahih Bukhari. And they won't say, Hada hadithun mawdu'a, or anything like that, because that's not polite. They understand that there are two transmissions. So the Sufis, the real ones, the genuine ones, they're the heirs of that. They get many things, and they have many books and many manuscripts. And some of them have access to manuscripts, you know, that are and these are hidden, by the way, that will tell you about what's happening right now. Believe it or not. <coughs> Believe it or not. They have, but that's top secret. And in fact, if you, you wouldn't be allowed to see it, nor would I. And the person who is allowed to see it might be allowed to see it for a day or two days, or a week, and then give it back and leave. Go away. Okay, so they are the keepers of secrets also. And this is why we have taslim to them. We believe in them. And when you believe in them, you are a wali of Allah. You are, and I believe in them, and so do you. We believe in them. We love them. And uh, then do taslim. And as they say, you know, that, uh, what do they say about the Hilal? That if you didn't see it with your own eyes, then, you know, then, then sell them to the ones who saw it with their eyes. Okay, like you saw the Hilal of Sha'ban, so you know we're in Sha'ban. Um, maybe I didn't see it, but I trust you. If you saw it, you saw it. We saw it. So this is the way that is, bi Lahi ta'ala. Uh, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about things like numbers. Because of the fact that, um, you know, in the path, you should. It's good to begin at the beginning, and that's why, um, you know, in some of the some of the paths. And again, I don't want to criticize any path that is not like this. Don't take this as a personal criticism, but especially in the paths I've been associated with, which are more than one. You know, you begin with something really easy, really easy, and then you add on. You add on. You add on. And in the beginning, that dhikr is medicine. And medicine should not be mistaken for food. You don't eat your medicine for dinner like you would eat the chicken that we had or the beef. But after you're well and you're strong, then the medicine turns into part of the diet. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm saying great because she told me what time it is. She always tells me what time it is. Um, in reference to the Hadith Qudsi, the Wali that Allah loves, does Allah not love everyone to start with, or does He love only a few? Um, his name is Al-Wadud, <coughs> and uh, you know, Wadud is what, a very special name. Um, we had a beautiful wedding just a f yesterday, and, um, and we have a br brother sitting back there that had a beautiful wedding last year. And um, of course, in our weddings we talk about the fact that the purpose of marriage is mawadda and rahma, right? That min ayatihi and khalaqa lakum min anfusikum azwajan li taskunu ilayha. He created from you spouses from yourself that you find peace in them. Wa ja'ala baynakum mawadda wa rahma. And he put between you mawadda and rahma. May all of our marriages have this. May all of our marriages have this. And you have to do ijtihad to keep it there. And if it's lost, you bring it back. And you can. You can. Don't ever think that you cannot make that marriage better than the first day. You can. You may need help, but you can and you should. But <clears throat> mawadda is protective love. You know, and it's the kind of love that the mother and father have for the baby so that when it cries at 2 a.m., they'll get up and change the diaper. 
okay, even though you're so tired, and you haven't slept for a week, for a month, but you'll get up and do that. And it's the kind of love that if the baby were not messing that diaper, you would be worried to death. Because it's got to pass this excrement, right? It's got, its stomach's got to be working. So you're actually happy that it's messing the diaper. Because it means it's, inshallah, healthy. Okay, that's mawadda. It's the love that the doctor, the real doctor, has for the patient. It's the love that the real teacher has for the student. So God is a wadud. He loves creation in that sense. And he is ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And Rahma is the giving of everything needed to do what needs to be done. The Rahim, the womb of the female among mammals is the place where the Rahma comes. And in the Rahim of the lioness, God creates a little lion who will have fangs and will have claws and will have lion eyes and lion ears and a lion heart. He will give the lion everything it needs to be a lion, just as he creates you with everything you need to be a human being. That is Rahmah. So God has mercy on all of creation, and God gives a chance to all of creation. But the love of God that he has for his awliya is second to none. And there are hierarchies in creation, and there are levels of love, and we're not out of love, but we're out of time. <laughs> so we're going to end here. And um, inshallah, we are so honored and happy to have you here with us. And we hope to see you again tomorrow. Allahumma wafiqna lima tuhibbuhu wa tawdha wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada wa amitna ala kalimati al-huda alimna ma yanfa'una wa wafiqna lil'amali bima alamtana bih wa ja'al ma nahnu fihi خالصا مخلصا لوجهك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا بعده تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار uh, I'm really happy to be here and um, you know, mashallah, this is uh, such a blessing to be able to come here and visit you again and to see you. And um, these evenings we have here are just out of time. And may God benefit us by all these wonderful comings together and this beautiful company that people like you make possible. Wassalamu alaikum.